So we had the new camera. We covered that. Yep. Influence micro contemporary. We like touched on that, but I yeah, don't think we, no. we, uh, we, we're going to have to revisit that. We're going to have to come back to that. The creative act, the Rick Rubin book. No, did not. Yep. We didn't even alluded to it book. several times, <laughs> but didn't get into it. You tied it in nicely at the yeah, end though. Yeah. Project timelines. No creativity as a muscle starting losing motivation. Yeah. Didn't, I don't even think we even thought about uh, yeah. that. And you could argue that Rough. even some of these could be entire episodes. This just, is going to be epi- the own. next episode. <laughs> <laughs> um, naming the podcast. Right. Pretension. We didn't really talk about that. No. Nope. We did, though. I had, I call myself an artist in yes. parentheses. Yep. Or I can't call myself an artist in parentheses. And that, that kind of kicked things off. And we did talk about that. Let us. Attempting a thesis and why for the podcast. Yeah. Definitely didn't even touch that. No. So we talked about the new camera. We talked about the new camera and and the the prompt about the artist. The thing artist yeah. led us into a discussion about. So what I'd things. give us one point three out of yeah six. Agreed. It had been a golden afternoon, and I remember having the familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summer. So, so. I would rather take something that works really well and doesn't look beautiful than something that's beautiful and doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take function over form personally, but I personally gravitate towards the thing that does both, that has both function. And, and, and maybe another aspect of function is not only that it, that it does what it's supposed to do well, but that it's also built to last. It's made out of durable, high quality materials um, and the design is informed by, uh, just as much as the function is, and those, feel... those products are difficult to find. And, yeah. and I think finding community with other people that know of them. Uh, and that's one thing I love about content creation is yeah. if you can get someone that is just kind of tells it like it is, you can get those shortcuts to the product services, software, whatever it is that, that melds Mm -hmm. function and form and when you find people who are like-minded in that yeah in that that this is one thing i struggle with with my in-laws and my wife is they're very much based on function and cost 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 is how do i have something that functions and is as inexpensive as possible and my whole philosophy is you know um my buddy doc rock always says uh buy it nice or buy it twice and i would rather spend more money on something that is functional has beautiful form or good form and is also made to last. Uh, that's why people say they don't build them like they used to all that stuff and yeah. why we're drawn to that's older I mean, analog things. Y- you put it at the top of my list of, you know, you yeah. talk about yeah. the life advice uh, or the, the principles. Yeah. And that's one of my major principles. And mm-hmm. I learned that really young because I, my dad would always do the opposite. Yes. And he doesn't have anything because all of his shit is broken. Broke. Yep. <laughs> so every time I buy something and I buy more than I'd like to, but I don't same here eat. most of it. So the, the issue is you start to build this, well, there's the best version of this and I just need to work my way to that. And you have to get the best version of everything in your life. And that's not, it's not a good way to, to approach it, but you, you, you buy stuff with the mindset that, you're going to have this forever. Yeah. And what's eventually going to happen is I'm going to have all of this, you know, shit Mm -hmm. and then I'm going to die and my kids aren't going to want it. My grandkids aren't going to want it. Mm -hmm. No, they'll they'll want a piece of it. And hopefully I can show that the value of some of these things, Oh man, you know, hopefully I write something great with that typewriter. And I'm like, this was the typewriter that this was written on. I want you to have this. And then it, it helps to, at least identify the value a little. It, it it's a, a more effective way of taping the value onto mm-hmm. it in their minds. Maybe the the like it's, oh these all these great photos were taken on this camera. This is yours now. Right. But you, you spend all your life collecting stuff that you're gonna nobody's gonna care about at some point. We were in an antique store the other day and there were a bunch of bowling trophies. Oh yeah. And <laughs> I was, I told my Audrey, wife has a few actual bowling trophies of her own. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> there were hundreds of probably a hundred bowling trophies. Yeah. Like first place. Da, 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 da. And I, I pointed to him and I told Audrey, I was like, you know what this is probably this was somebody's entire life. Yeah. 
this was what they cared about more than anything in the their world. life's work, their life's work. And they were so proud of this. And mm-hmm. now it's just an inanimate object that nobody will buy. Nope. And it's sitting in an antique store waiting to be trashed. Cause it doesn't really have any function. Yeah. Other than, uh, you know, a, a reminder, a memory, uh, a, a, a marker of achievement for the individual who achieved, uh, what that trophy stands for. Yeah. So other than that, which doesn't specific, have value to anybody else, right? it doesn't, it's like family photos, yeah. right? I mean, you, you and I've had discussions about the family photos before, right? There's some of the best photography you'll ever see is just in bins of old family photos. Absolutely. It's unbelievable. I mean, it's unachievable by anybody Mm -hmm. and it was somebody's trash. Yeah. But why do we, why do we accept photos of strangers and photos of strange things when they're presented to us in the form of art? Yeah. By some significant photographer, Mm -hmm. but family photos have no, we don't even put the effort in to give them a context or to give them a significance. Why is that? That's, you know, there's no difference between a William Eggleston photo and some of these, I mean, obviously being a William Eggleston photo, but some of these family photos are just as intriguing, just as fascinating, just as beautiful. I wonder if it's in the intention behind the photo. Yeah. And William Eggleston going out and connecting with something. It's uh, weird, you know, and trying to capture it on film intentionally versus, uh, you know, someone who has a kid's birthday party or they're at a car race that they, you know, their, their they're uncle is grabbing. in and they're grabbing they're you know, they're just taking photos to, as a, as a Accidental memento masterpieces of it. There's no doubt that some of them, if you look yeah. through, you know, shoe boxes full of these things, that there's going to be two, three, four that just kind of grab you in a certain way. And others that would might you, not, would you say we over index as a, as a society, we over index on intention or, do you think on even a more mystical level that intention intention shines through in the final work? Cause I think that could be true. It sure. sounds really mystical. I know. I just think, I think and I, I have no way to describe yeah. it with any kind of, but you see something with a, a grand amount of intention behind it and it does feel a little bit more significant for some reason. And maybe that's all in our mind. I, I, I think it is. I mean, for me, you know, uh, we were talking about this when we met earlier, I was talking about, uh, Fred Herzog and the photos that I saw of his, uh, through T Hopper's video on YouTube. And I look at these photos as she shows them on her video. And I am just like blown away by mm-hmm. how beautiful are. There's one photo where, um, it's a storefront and there's a window and there's, um, curtains yeah. and there's a space in the curtain and a woman's arm is visible yeah. resting on a yeah. couch in the space. And I go, the framing, the color, you know, it's slide film. Um, you know, the way everything about it just seems it's like impossible. a rock, Rockwell painting. And yeah. It just seems impossible. Mm-hmm. And this person saw it and captured it beautifully. And the magic of that to me is so moving. Mm-hmm. Um, that I, I almost feel like I'm there. I understood what, you know, I, I you know, if I saw that I, I would be grabbed by it as well, but he was the one that captured the photo. Yeah. Whereas if I look through family photos, even though I might find a photo that is intriguing, like there's one photo of my mom from, uh, from when we were kids. And actually, I think it's actually super eight. I'm conflating the two because I've seen them so many times, but I think it's super eight footage. And there's just in a lot of these shots, there's just sort of this, distant feeling for my mom who is all of like 22 with two kids um and married to her former high school english teacher yeah and there's this distance in her eyes in her in the way she looks and the person filming it my dad is not filming her with the intention of capturing a woman that is in an emotional state that is intriguing to him he's just documenting someone decorating a christmas tree grab my wife here yeah grab a but i look at it and i go you know, now part of that though, if it was just a stranger, 
like we talked about a shoebox full yeah. of some strangers' family photos, I don't know that I would see that. Because it's your because, mom. Because I know. Building. Yeah. And how I would mom. feel if I was 22 years old and all of a sudden had two kids and a stepdaughter. And but what, then and all this you know craziness going on in my life. Let's pretend it's not your mom, and I'm I'm not trying to step on that, yeah. but just for the sake of thought experiment. And it was just a random 22 year old woman. Yeah. You know, would you eventually probably work to that same place? Maybe you don't know the backstory, but then right. suddenly there's this endless possibility for backstory. I think no matter what, there's something about my mom's energy and demeanor in the yeah. footage that communicates something other than someone just happily decorating a Christmas tree. Yeah. Uh, so yes, I, I do. I do think so. And I, and I think that, that someone finding something like that, that is really profound to them in a pile of footage or a shoebox of photos where the person capturing it did not intend to capture that beauty or magic or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think it could be just as profound as flipping through a Fred Herzog photography book yeah. and seeing photo after photo that is, that is significantly impactful. Um, and maybe the rarity of that makes it even more yeah. special than someone who intentionally shot it. So yeah. it's almost, it is true documentary, right? Yeah. It's like, but the, yeah, I, I, you know, so I, I, you know, uh, I gravitate again because I, I am someone who was trying to take photographs like these masters, yeah. um, in my own way, hopefully, but of course influenced by them. But, but you know, the, there is something equally special about someone who captures something unintentionally, uh, and possibly even more special. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I was at, uh, an antique store here in Omaha and it, they had boxes of family, family photos, photos. Yeah. or pages torn out from photo albums. And it's just, you know, I probably spent five minutes going through them and I don't know that I was like, are any of these special? Yeah. Um, but they weren't, they were not remarkable to me, but yeah. it also could be because of the context. Yeah. They've been discarded. They've been given like, how could any of these be special if they've basically been one step above the trash bin by yeah. being at this random antique store in Omaha. Yeah. If I look through them again going, are there any that say something else or have some other element to them? Or maybe this person did have some talent or compositional instincts, even if they weren't aware of it when they were taking yeah. the photo, did they subconsciously take quality photos or something interesting uh, you know, I'd well, be curious it, to go back it and begs look. all of these questions. Like what is interesting? What is right. compositionally a good photo? What is the lack of intentionality you could argue is what makes it interesting. Well, because you, absolutely. Cause it's just, it's somebody setting out to capture their perspective, yeah. their reality, which is well in the lack of artistic intention. There yeah. is intention, but it's just different. Than There's what no, we're used well, to. And yeah. It's so suddenly that raises the question. And we're not going to try to answer this or sure. you know, there's much smarter people than us that have done better jobs, but the lack of artistic intention, like we talked about on, on the last episode kind of removed some of that intellectual mm -hmm. exercise from it. It removes some of that pretension or self-importance and it becomes more about the subject, right? Which is kind of the entire mm -hmm. goal of, you know, you want to be a master of your craft. If that craft is photography, the goal is to, uh, Gary Winogrand would always talk about he he wanted to not exist. Yes, it, it yeah. was just the camera floating through mm -hmm. this reality, yeah. and he he always wanted to find out. He was constantly seeking to find out what reality looked like mm -hmm. outside of his head, because you can never see reality outside of your right. own reality. Yes, and as photographers, when you get to a certain point, I feel like you are searching for that that meta reality or that yeah that final finite reality or maybe it's infinite you know maybe yeah. it's not finite you're looking for that just reality as it is mm -hmm. not there's no projection happening right from the the artist and you could argue that when you remove all of those intentions those artistic right. intentions that's the purest form of that and that's the word i use when i 
think of that concept, I think of the word pure and I think of the word truth. Yeah, truth. Um, the, the absence of bias, the absence of me trying, you know, I talked about, and the, the last time we talked, I talked about me creating to serve my ego of wanting to be perceived of as an artist or a screenwriter or whatever. And, yeah. and all that comes with that. But, and, and part of why maybe I'm gravitating towards the form of photography and especially people like Gary Winog Winogrand and, um, Fred Herzog and these other photographers is going, they're not doing it to serve their ego yeah. because they want to be a famous art photographer or they want a show at MoMA or they, yeah. you know, all that. Maybe some do, and maybe some of them Absolutely. did have that. I don't know, but my well, feeling is Gary, that Gary. they are compelled to go out there and snap photos because yeah. I don't know. And it ties in with Rick's book, but uh, you know, they are, they can't help themselves. And it feels like it's more in service to the truth and purity than it is in service to themselves. Well, and Gary would always talk about, <laughs> or people that knew Gary would always talk about him photographing at the most ridiculous times or, yeah. Why are you, why are you taking photos? Well, nobody else is going to take photos of this. Right. It was something to him beyond I'm going out to express my mm -hmm. intention. It was so much more. And that's why the work is so staggering to this day is because it was more. It wasn't just this artist who was, I have this image that I want to get out. Right. And an agenda. Yeah. An agenda. And there have been some great projects that have explored the idea of these, these photos. I know, um, Alex Soth had a project last year, the year before, called The Pound of Pictures. Mm -hmm. And one of the creative kind of threads that he began pulling at to develop that project was he found on eBay or somewhere online that he could order pictures by the pound. Yeah. You pay by the pound. And of just, just random pictures. Random pictures. Yeah. And I, some store somewhere in the world, and they just, okay, you, that's six pounds of pictures. That's, you know, four ninety four a pound. Yep. <laughs> All right. You pay the 20 something dollars and there you go. Yeah. There's your six pounds of photos. And he, he would just go through these photos and yeah. find all of this staggering work because suddenly you are projecting yeah. that or these artistic intentions onto it. And you're like, wow, this is unbelievable. Uh, and that was never the original intention. So it, it raises a lot of questions and I don't think <laughs> this is its own episode in, in a lot of ways, I don't want to continue to talk about this for like the next 30 minutes, but I, it's a fascinating topic. Well, and just, and it's something I'd love to, even if we just maintain yeah. the dialogue throughout the, the rest of this year and see where it gets us by. Well, and it's just, I mean, this is, you know, to me, one of the centerpiece conversations about what, you know, we're t trying to talk about yeah. in this podcast is you know, making great art and what does that mean? Yeah. Um, and I think the beauty of it is it's not up to us to define it yeah. because it's really, well, I had that later in the notes is I heard this thing the other day and it put into words something that I've always felt or I've always wanted to express. I've never been comfortable or tried to perpetuate the idea of, me being an artist, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons is, first of all, what does that word mean? Yeah. That's just a terrible word mm -hmm. to, from the beginning, anybody that calls themselves an artist. And I, I don't mean this in an offensive way, or I'm trying to tear other people down. I just, I don't, if you call yourself an artist, haven't you kind of defeated the purpose of being a true artist in the first place? If you yeah. feel comfortable calling yourself that. And I wanted to get your thoughts on it because I know that's something we talked about in the last podcast of kind of developing past the state and figuring out that you can be the one that has that connection. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt comfortable? Has that changed? What do you call yourself? I always err on the side if if Audrey has a hard time explaining to people what I do, I'm doing something right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, and I, I you know, part of me part of me likes that there's confusion about what I do. Like 
wait is, so wait you just you make videos for the internet in your basement <laughs> it sounds so bad <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I do. There's, you know, there's, there's so much that goes into it. You know, I, you know, we've had conversations where I, um, I don't feel comfortable calling myself an artist because I think of other people as artists. I think of my brother. Um, I think of, uh, you know, I, I think of maybe it's a cliche, like the sort of struggling, tormented person who, you know, isn't necessarily, uh, filled with intention, but they're filled with compulsion, yeah. uh, obsession, uh, and they can't not create these things that are hard to describe or explain. Yeah. They find whatever form it is and it just comes out of them. And then you have people that say they're a painter or they're a sculptor and, and, and I'm not trying to judge or whatever, but sometimes I wonder if, we label ourselves as that more in service to our ego and the idea Absolutely. that we want to have our self image and how we want to project ourselves out on the world because it sounds intriguing or interesting, or it makes us look cool or it yeah. f- makes us feel a sense of accomplishment in a life where maybe we've struggled to find what our calling is or to find success or whatever. Cause there's so many things that go into it from cultural pressure to what people expect of you. And that's where like, even with my family and and not as much my side of the family, but my wife's side of the family, where I think they, they are so disconnected from, uh, artistic pursuits or creative pursuits. No, not to say that they're not creative or they don't have the capacity to be creative, but you know, they are very much on that function side of things, uh, go to work, punch the clock, earn your revenue, go on, you know, a family trip, um, have, you know, spaghetti and meatballs for dinner, you know, like, it's, and that's not to say that they like don't have letting a depth. muscle atrophy, yeah. right? But they look, I, I think they look at me and because I don't fit into that context of, you know, working for the hospital as the IT person or, um, you know, the marketing director for the convention visitors bureau, I'm more nebulous and sort of amorphous and they, they don't know what I do. Yeah. Like, I think even to the point where they would be, they're surprised I make money doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and even though I consider myself someone who does creative things for a living, there's still a lot of like, you know, craft and technical crap, like yeah. editing and organizing files and maintaining hard drives and all this stuff. So, so it's difficult, but then at the same time I go out and make photography videos and have moved into photography because of that compulsion aspect. Like I am drawn to capturing moments through video, photo writing, you know, these artistic uh, forms expressions or whatever. Yeah. Um, it was the, the, the thing that brought it to top of mind for me was, I was listening. It was an Anthony Bourdain interview. Mm. I just watched an Anthony Bourdain clip this morning. We've been watching. <laughs> we watched the entirety of Cook's tour and yeah. No Reservation. We've mm-hmm. just been going crazy on it. Mm-hmm. But the somebody asked him about f- chefs and art. Yeah. And if you're an amazing chef, you're just as much an artist as an amazing 100 percent painter or an amazing. You're creating something. You have raw materials and you're creating something Mm -hmm. that transcends and you're playing with memory you're playing Mm -hmm. with sense smell sight yep sound you're on some could say it's it's a more and form function and forms a craft yeah some could say it's a more immersive form of art than cinema you could make that Mm -hmm. argument they'd be wrong (laughs) (laughs) um i've had some pretty great meals i've had some (laughs) no and it 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 really transcends and you're you're i i I just think it's an interesting thing that people, not enough people see, but the question was posed to Bourdain. Who are chefs that you see as artists? And he thought about it for a, for a couple of, couple of moments and then said, I think there's only a couple that truly, and in his mind, he's just, I forget what he calls himself. It's a wandering professional or something. Yep. That's what he called himself. And the, he said, there's a couple that 
they look at things so differently. They approach the form from such a crazy, unique, there's nothing else to call them but artists. Yeah. Then there's people that are so highly skilled at their craft. I mean, we're talking 10,000 hours times four, yep. right? They're just absolute technical masters. Technical masters. And he put a distinction between that. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's different from being an artist, I a true so artist. He's, and he made the joke, everybody is an artist these days. Mm -hmm. Everybody's, this person's an artist. This person's a podcast artist. This person's this artist. And we, we like to be inclusive in our world. We like, you don't want to limit somebody's potential by saying, oh, you have to do this to be this. Mm -hmm. or, but I think that's a good way to look at it from any perspective. There's unbelievable filmmakers who have achieved the highest level of technical proficiency ever achieved. Yeah. And then there's somebody like a Martin Scorsese who can come in and shift what it, what a film looks and feels like. Right. There's somebody like, uh, you know, it was a great painter. The, the reference he used was we're talking Picasso here. Yes. We can't just lump anybody into that. No. And I think that's really interesting because you and I both like to uh, highly index the, the technical side, the craft side of things. Sure. It's very important. It's a very important. It, it's a must. I don't think if you're going to be, if you are an artist, mm -hmm. if the, the technical proficiency is going to come with that, even and if the, it's not and the intended. Discipline. And the discipline is going to yeah. most likely... Or you can the kind discipline of, just of the craft flounder, right? Not you, your personal discipline. I think of that's part of it. I think of some of these amazing artists who are artists, true artists, and they reach the technical proficiency, but then you see late career slumps or something or another because yeah. the discipline wasn't there. But then you have somebody like a Picasso who was a great artist. Mm -hmm. He was abstracted to every contemporary not every i mean i know there's other we're not gonna have that discussion but yeah. there's his discipline was there he yeah. was every day he was working every day, like yeah. it was he was this was his job and mm -hmm. and so his output was with the, the the his technical proficiency was huge and the abstracted thought the true artistry was there yeah and that's how you get somebody who gets to a level like that then you have somebody like a hunter thompson maybe who kind of puts out fear and loathing or, you know, you have a F Scott Fitzgerald who puts out Gatsby and then goes and drinks his sorrows away in Kurt Hollywood Cobain. and barely gets out another work. Kurt Cobain, the 27, all Club. of these. Yeah. You have people who have this, they clearly have this artistic vision. The technical side is there and it's just like, but whether it's the discipline, whatever is not there. Or it's the societal con, the societal con, <clears throat> Or is it the societal constructs that interfere with those artists? Um, uh, you know, in the restaurant world, I think of Charlie Trotter and everything that happened to him as uh, his restaurant uh, kind of flatlined a little bit. What things in our culture put pressures and uh, and stifle that artistic obsession? Like the Michelin Michelin stars are. Well, yeah, the, the yeah the Michelin stars, um, the reviews in the re in the magazines, uh, just normal stuff like him having to deal with some health issues yeah. and not going to a doctor, uh, uh, competitiveness with other people, like your own psychological constructs that interfere with the purity and truth of artistic expression. Yeah. How do those things analytics on your analytics? Your work. Yeah, the gamification, um, uh, it's, revenue. Uh, it's all so these things interesting that, that influence what you create and how you create it. When maybe you started from a really pure place, like let's say a Kurt Cobain, and then oh, you got to be on SNL next week, and then you got to be on the Today Show, and you got to do this, and then this whole like financial commercial construct builds around it. And some people, maybe Picasso is an example, where he just was able to manage that stuff embrace and continue it to work, way, yeah. embrace it or reject certain things. He had more, he didn't have other people that were depending on him. Uh, and not to say that that's truly the case. I don't know for yeah. sure, but you know, you see people that 
that. But you, you have a Scorsese who's yeah. still putting out mm-hmm. crazy output and has managed to... And then using his position also to preserve the work of other artists that if he wasn't preserving their work... I sound like a total Scorsese nerd on this <laughs> pod so far. I'm pretty Can't sure. Can't wait for Flowers, flowers of the Killer. Killer Killers of the Killers Flower, of the flower Moon. moon it's, if, if I sound like I'm <laughs> completely obsessed with Scorsese, it's because I am. Yeah. <laughs> it's just, He's one of those people that... Yeah. As I get older, I find myself looking to people who have done it. And Dylan yeah. is a great example. Mm-hmm. You know, Dylan had more commercial expectations on yeah. him than anybody. And I just listened to the live project that he recorded a year ago. Yeah. And it's a lot of those songs from the 60s and 70s reimagined mm-hmm. with his current sound. And it's smoky and it's, oh, it's so good. As you start to pass those ages in in life you start to look and say okay but who's doing this at 80 who's doing this right. at 85 yep who's doing this at we talked about joel meyerowitz last week you know he's still he's still out there isn't gray art still doing Is yeah he's st- yeah yep yep and it's so who's internalized these practices to a point where the discipline's there it's been right. there and it hasn't it hasn't waned David well, Bowie was creating yeah. great, great stuff right up until the, the week that he died. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's maybe some arguments too, that they Prince. blend in a little bit more than when they first made their, made their appearance because what they did when they first came, so came unfortunate out was too. so, was so, uh, mind bending yeah. or culture shifting or a voice that we hadn't seen or heard before some literally of like a singing voice, but then also, you know, the voice of the artist and as culture and other artists kind of, uh, materialize around the form or the, the, the voice that they created and blend in with it, you know, they're not necessarily lost, but, um, they're, they don't, they, maybe they don't stand out as prominently or again, we're fixated on the new thing, like great, you know, gray art yeah. and his photo- photography is amazing, but look at what this person over here is doing. And they've He's got a YouTube channel and they have an yeah. Instagram account yeah. and it's new and novel and you know, whatever that is. Yeah. And then, you know, you always see too, when an, a great artist passes away and, um, or, or they have, uh, they have fallen blended in a little bit more or maybe not created as prolifically or, what they're doing and creating is still reminiscent of yeah. the stuff that really put them on the map. Um, we rediscover them. Uh, you know, I think of the beach boys and Brian Wilson, you know, yeah. he's still putting out new music as recently as just a few years ago. And the, the thing, the thing about it though, is that'll never, they're not making music to fit in with the contemporary. Right. Our, our kids and our grandkids are going to discover Brian Wilson because they listen to pet sounds or mm-hmm. whatever. And hopefully that encourages them to dig deeper. And then they do discover some of the new Brian Wilson or they discover the, they, they listen to highway 61 or Mm -hmm. blonde on blonde. And then they're like, Oh, let's keep going. And they do discover. And I think it's, it's always interesting when an artist manages to the, the cultural zeitgeist or the cultural, that's never been a good watermark. I feel like for anything, Um, although you could argue that these people that we're talking about wouldn't have been, we wouldn't be talking about them if they weren't the watermark at one point in time, but the, the, the work that they're creating is, is going to be there forever. But I always find it interesting when an artist leaves the zeitgeist and manages to come back. So you think Dylan, you know, the highway 61 and the folk folk Dylan was early sixties, mid sixties mm-hmm. was kind of the foray into rock. Then he came back in, in the seventies with some of these country sounds and he, you know, he had blood on the tracks, which is an all time great album. That's 15 years later. Mm-hmm. Think about that. 15 years ago, it was 2008, 2000, 2008, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's think of how different things are from 2008 now. And that was the period of time. And then, <laughs> that was what 70 was that 73 73 ish fast forward 25 more years and another great album it wins wins a grammy and right you it 
re connects with the cultural zeitgeist somehow and Mm -hmm. oh that's that's 40 years 40 years yeah and so remarkable things like that you know we talk about oh man drake has just been dominant for 13 years Mm -hmm. 40 40 years. years staying power staying and there's something to that work and you know the same the same way we watch you could go back and watch raging bull or listen to mozart read shakespeare i mean talk about staying read read shakespeare absolutely (laughs) truly read shakespeare and it's unbelievable you go back and watch you know in the last couple of years i feel like the godfather has gotten reinvigorated because of the the marketing pushes and you go back and watch that movie and it's just as just as good as it was Maybe Absolutely. it's better because now you have all this expectation, but sure, it's crazy. You know, creating something with staying power. How how does that? What are some of the factors of that? And you don't you don't necessarily want to break it down to try to recreate it because I don't know if that's not how it's done. There's yeah, no point there's no that. playbook. There's no playbook. You just gotta right. you just gotta make what you feel and that. But it's cra- It is that that's always astonishing for me is that forty year Dylan, yeah, comeback. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that that's just. You know, that's un- unbelievable. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, you think about uh, him creating something like that after 40 years and what role does our collective knowledge and understanding of who he is, the legend, the living legend that he is, you know, what role does that play in, you know, in in lifting up that perception of what he's created? Not to not to take yeah. away from what he's created, but, I'm, you know, I'm always curious about what our own biases our collective re- recognition of someone just to clarify are you are name. you saying like like suddenly that earlier work is even more significant because he was able to uh, i'm saying i wonder sometimes with artists or creators that we have revered and um you know been astonished by what they've made over the years that does that make us perceive of what they've created 40 years later with all this additional bias and um and weight that we want to give to it uh and that it, not yeah. not that it's not as good as what they made earlier i don't know but you go but in with what, expectation yeah, well expectation and there's just so much gravity mm-hmm. and mass around who some of these people are that if picasso were around today and made a new painting yeah would we love it because picasso did it even though it's it's not as good as his earlier works. Yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like that's a constant thing that people get get hit with. Though is it's not as good as your early stuff, and that's why it is so impressive. Because you know, speaking of Dylan or Martin Scorsese, you could say he reinvigorated his career when he made maybe Wolf 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 of Wall Wolf Street. Of Wall probably Street, yeah. was was the film that did it. Yeah, and it suddenly took him from. I mean, he was making, he was constantly making good films. There's a lot of good films, sure. but you know, he had the seventies the where mm-hmm. it was just yeah. taxi driver, raging bull, incredible, just boom, 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 boom. And then he had good fellas in mm-hmm. the nineties, you know, um, raging bull was eighties too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and then he has a, a lull period. Sure. And then he comes out and he puts Wolf of Wall Street comes out and suddenly he's back in the absolute center of the cultural zeitgeist and in, in cinema. And he's 70 something at that point. But then you go back and you revisit. Oh, Casino actually wasn't as bad as I remember Casino, it. Casino so good. You know, oh man, this uh, Last Temptation of Christ actually pretty yeah. pretty interesting film. And, and one of my favorites it, has always been Cape Fear. Cape His Fear. Remake of Cape oh, Fear. great. Yeah, really good. Just De Niro oh, shredded yeah. and <laughs> Matt, Matt, wherever you are. Um, that movie is so uncomfortable to watch in Big a good time. way, in a yeah. good way. I mean, well, and, and, and Tarantino says, you know, like a good director has about 10 films in them and then they nonsense, off, you know, nonsense. Right? But, but, but I think that's kind of that, that, yeah. you know, that's part of that conversation as well. Um, the other, the other thing too, in that, you know, if Picasso painted something today, would we revere it because it's Picasso? Would we revere it because on its own, it's an amazing piece of artwork. Yeah. You know, what role does the artist l- status reputation play in our assessment of that art? Well, and this and is, this is more have, important than ever because of AI. Sure. Yeah. Well, and you have new artists that come out 
um, and is part of why we love their work because we're able to assess it more purely because they don't have a reputation. And, uh, you know, they're this new flashy thing that created this beautiful painting or an amazing photograph. And that's what leads our assessment. It is what the work looks like or how it impacts us, not how our understanding of who they are as an artist impacts us. And then we process their art. Uh, you know, just how we consume it too is interesting. And going back to Scorsese, um, what an amazing interpreter and uh, thinker about the cinema, cinematic yeah. arts. And just to listen to him talk about a movie and break it down. It's incredible. Is like, I mean, I, I have gone from sort of having a ho-hum reaction to a movie to then watching the special features where he talks about this movie. And my entire perception of that movie is elevated tenfold yeah. because he pointed things out that I didn't understand because of a lack of historical context. Yeah. The challenge, like like how some this type of thing was never depicted on film before. Uh, and all of a sudden you have this different appreciation for what was accomplished. I think you almost just answered our original question too of does intention right. shine through? And it might not shine through, through in the mystical way that I was thinking about it earlier, but it might shine through in you watch a Scorsese film and you know everything is intentional. Right. Everything is there for a reason. Mm -hmm. And there's still room, like we said last week, there's still room to explore. Right. But that's part of the calculation is mm -hmm. how do I present room to explore? How do I mm -hmm. put this out? And then you watch something, whether it's a TV show or a television show or uh, whether it's a television show or a streaming show or something, even a lesser quality movie, maybe something that's more commercially driven, something with different intentions or goals behind it. And you feel, oh, this isn't quite, I, I just don't care as much because yeah. they, you have this close up in a Scorsese film and you're like, what is this? What's he showing here? You have a close up in there and it's probably just somebody who was like, okay, we covered it with two or three cameras and we need to cut to the close up mm -hmm. because it's time for a close up. Right. And that's, you know, that's where the intention shines through. Mm -hmm. And that probably over the course of a, of a longer piece of work, but yeah. And uh, not to get tied up. We, we went down this well, road. It's so I, difficult I because you have road. so, so few, I mean, film first of all is collaborative art form. Yeah. Um, so you have multiple people contributing to, right. you know, serve a single vision usually, but then in some cases, especially more commercial properties, um, you are going to have, uh, you know, other interests and other voices in there. You're going to have studio executives. You're going to have the studio head. You're going to have corporate interests. Like yeah. I was just, you know, rewatching at my in-laws, the beginning of back to the future. Cause it was on a marathon on TMC or AMC. And, uh, TMC. you know, there's three TCM, there's the yeah, matchup, <laughs> there's three product placements for Burger King and the yeah. first, you know, 15 minutes, there's a Mountain Dew product placement, you know, these, there's all these things where, you know, they're trying to create something. I would argue that's art, um, from Bob Zemeckis and, um, Bob Gale and Steven Spielberg, yeah. but they have these other things that they have to contend with these to so the point where they recast Michael J or recast Eric Stoltz as Eric Stoltz as the original Marty McFly yeah. uh, and put in Michael J. Fox. So, you know, it, then you can even think like a photographer or a sculptor or a painter who's commissioned to create something. Yeah. And, um, you know, what does that look like? I think about the crown and the scene where the painter that was commissioned to do Winston Churchill's portrait, Winston Churchill is expecting him to have a grand classical timeless yeah, portrait of look. him. A and certain he had one that was Churchill felt was grotesque, but that artist was trying to ask, he was trying to merge it together. Like they're paying me to do this, yeah. but I'm going to do it from a place of my artistic intention and vision. I'm going to get to know who this person really is. And I'm going to try to convey the yeah. truth of who he is, even if <laughs> Churchill doesn't like it. Well, and I feel like as people who consume a lot of this stuff and try to make ourselves familiar with what's come before sometimes there are situations specifically more commercial situations mm -hmm. where we like to to approach it with the thought of everybody's going to love this because this is the true 
Yeah. This is the truth or this is trying to get at the truth. And then the reality is, is people don't care, but there might be some commercial tactic or something that's more effective. Sure. And well, you know, you did this weird thing and it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe the, the whole concept was failed to not work in the first place, but then you went out on a limb. So you gave a scapegoat for, well, it's because you got all arty with it. Right. Um, I don't, I don't quite have the full point there, but it's right. something that I think about often, especially writing copy or doing something for mm -hmm. a commercial purpose where I'm just <laughs> essentially making up nonsense or whatever. Yeah. But I want to get us back on track because I know you have the camera story and yeah. I want to hear about that. I want to see the camera and then maybe we can uh, find at least one or two quotes <laughs> pretty much at our time so. already. But that's the beauty of this, you know, yeah. we, you know, you, and this again is, it kind of ties into the whole thing. You, you know, we can sit down ahead yeah. of time and kind of plot out what we think we should cover to provide value to the audience that might watch this. And as we sit down and talk, yeah. it takes us in a direction maybe that we didn't anticipate. And I think it gets the hope is that it still provides value. Absolutely. Um, and I think we're, you know, we're talking about all of these things and we're trying to create something that is along the same lines. We can kind of direct where it's going to go. Yeah. But if we're here discovering stuff and that's interesting, let's sure. visit, then hopefully the audience is as well. And that's the same. The same goes for film. The same goes for photography. The same goes for painting. The same goes for writing. Right. If you think it's interesting when you're putting it together, mm -hmm. there's a good chance it's going to be interesting well, I think that's why podcasts as a forum for the most part, not necessarily all podcasts, but a lot of podcasts are consumed so voraciously, even if it's in small numbers like ratings, but yeah. you have these kind of specific communities that are consuming this content. When you think about the the other side of it, like a talk show that's on rails, right? Yeah. We have certain segments, we have time, we have Gotta hit this, set this, questions, this. we talk yeah. with the guests beforehand, they have a funny anecdote or a little quirky story or whatever, kind of like my, my yeah. canon story, you know, like... When you watch that, you're you're captivated by the star or the host is really funny, whatever. Sometimes there's moments of improvisation or surprises. But for the most part, it just feels like it's on rails. It ha the same thing happens every yep. time. Whereas something like this, the hope would be that even if we set out to do four topics that yeah. we're going to try to cover, if we go uh, uh, kind of off, off track a little bit into this conversation about intention and yeah. Um, you know, artists work after 40 years, all the stuff that we just talked about is the audience watching that going, but that's, what's really happening in the moment. Like yeah. that's where they're really going. Yeah. And that's more interesting to us than Alex and Matt's itinerary <laughs> right, right. and them going, okay, now is the part where we segue into we do this, this or yeah. that or whatever. And I think, you know, we have, a, we've both gotten semi-comfortable sitting in front of a camera or talking yeah. to a camera. So we at least have the guide rails in our subconscious sure. to keep us. Yeah. I think the, the intent is to hopefully a form emerges. We do 20 episodes, 10 right. episodes, and hopefully the form emerges from that. And we'll definitely, you know, we're always going to be looking and critiquing and trying to mm -hmm. figure out ways to improve, but hopefully a form emerges and you don't go in with this predetermined idea. Of, right. It's, it, it really is a, a really stupid meta metaphor for this yeah. entire th topic that mm -hmm. we've had. It just, hopefully you go out and you explore and the form emerges from that. So I think well, that's kind of the approach. And I think the key is too, that all of our conversations that have made us decide to make a podcast are about this exploration of, yeah, what makes great art? Who are we? Are we an art? Are, are you? Are I an artist? Um, uh, am I an artist? Uh, and trying to have conversations about that exploration mm -hmm. because we don't have the answers. Yeah. We have things that have worked for us. We have, you know, we certainly could give each other advice, you know, whatever, and that might connect with our audience. But, you know, the, the idea is, is that we're all exploring this together. We're talking about what has worked and what hasn't worked in, in our uh, careers, our artistic pursuits, all of that stuff. Um, and that that's the more interesting thing. Not that we're like, and not that all podcasts are like this, but that we're not two gurus that have had all this success yeah. and we're going to tell you what to do yeah. to get to where we are. Um, whether 
you know, we're selling some course or a system yeah. or our book or whatever. I mean, it we is. are exactly <laughs> where it looks like we are in the process. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's all. That's, that's all there really is to it. I, mean, I think we both have ambitions to. It's not like we have ambitions of grandiose luxury or we just sure i think both of us would be happy at this stage just creating the work that is fulfilling and m makes us proud mm -hmm. continuing to further these skill sets that we've become yeah we've fallen in love with and financially be able to sustain right. at least a mild level of i don't know whatever that looks like yeah and it doesn't look like we're making twenty five million dollars, and we need to. I'm famous, uh, and I yeah. We need awards. to optimize these clicks, and I mean, I think everybody is has gone through something. Most people have gone through a period of life where they they've over indexed on mm -hmm. being a celebrity or something like that. But at least personally speaking, I I have no interest in being a celebrity. I I like the idea of ha having influence because. I know how important the, my influences have been on me and yeah. I would love to be that to somebody else, but that's not coming from a, I want to be that's right. And I, I promise you, I've, I've done a lot of self-reflection on this and it's not coming from a place of, of ego. At least I don't, I don't believe it is. I think it's coming from a place of, it's the same reason I wanted, I want to make movies. It's right. the same reason I, I, I movies were the thing that were most profoundly effective on who I became. Same here. And so I gravitate towards that. Yeah. Um, and I've, you know, moved more towards videos, yeah. for lack of a better term, just thinking about something that's released online through YouTube, you know, versus a cinema or a streaming yeah. platform or whatever that is, you know, a narrative story that a big crew makes or a small crew makes, telling a story, et cetera, et cetera. I've gravitated towards videos, moved away from the big influence that was on me with cinema and film, yeah. um, partially because, uh, <laughs> making a movie is expensive, <laughs> even a low budget one. Like you said, it requires a lot of people. The, yeah. The yeah. democratization of these tools, like we can make a podcast, video podcast or audio podcast very relatively yeah. easily with a low, low input. It's, it's sometimes hard enough just to get the two of us on yeah, the same page. Absolutely. So, Hey, are we going to record today? Uh, yeah. let's do it tomorrow. Uh, right. I don't get to it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so, you know, I've gravitated towards videos because, uh, the, the ability to go from vision to completed product requires so much less input and yeah. help and money and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, on the flip side too, I may not just have the compulsion at a deep enough level, like a Scorsese or a Spielberg yeah. or other filmmakers that go, Got I'm <laughs> doing this and literally every fiber of my being and every resource yeah. I have is going to go towards making, making these things because it, it is the only thing for me. Whereas I have found, you know, real fulfillment in videos, photos. I think it's, <laughs> you, you gave the Tarantino quote earlier. Yeah. What a position of arrogance to be like only 10. Only 10. Imagine making 10 films. <laughs> like, well, I, I think that what's going to be really interesting is because I think his next one will be his ninth or 10th. I can't remember yeah. if he's, you know, if he's going to keep it's making just, after It's the so fact. funny. Like imagine what's, there's, there's a quote out there. Somebody said it. The fact that any film ever gets made is an absolute miracle. hundred percent. And here it is. Oh, there's only 10 great ones. Yeah. It's like, oh, out of the 25 that year. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, speaking of them being very difficult to make, and we won't go down too much of a rabbit hole, my buddy uh, Micah, who I visited when my family went out to Colorado, we stayed with him and his family for part of the time and uh, went to Estes Park and stayed on our own there. He's a WGA screenwriter. Uh, I went to film school with him. And he's on hold right now for uh, all of his projects. One screenplay he wrote just got re-optioned and he got a, a one-step deal to do a rewrite with the team that's getting involved. Um, but he can't do anything of the writer's because strike. of the writer's strike. Yeah. And so we've always talked, of course, about making a film together, uh, whether it was something he wrote, I wrote, rewrote together, however it came to be. And so we talked about that quite a bit um, while yeah. I was, you know, the kind of our fireplace chats in Colorado. Yeah, yeah. And 
you know, the first thing I think of with even a small sort of um, contained drama that he wrote, yeah. I think of the massive undertaking that it is to get yeah. crew, a 15 day shoot budget. I mean, you just throw out some, even some rudimentary numbers mm-hmm. and you're talking $250,000 to he, pay if, crew, yeah, all <laughs> that stuff. I mean, that's on the extreme only, low end. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, it's uh, it, it, yeah, it takes a really special person to yeah. see that whatever their vision is, film wise, gets completed to the finished product. Yeah. And I don't know that I am that person, and and, and I have <clears throat> a somewhat sort of jaded, frustrated viewpoint of the whole Hollywood system yeah. after my own experiences writing spec screenplays You might not even want to be that person. You know, you don't... Yeah. There's plenty of... I think everybody well, thought Casey Neistat would go on to right. make... Oh, he, he made all this money with the vlog. He's going to make real films now. Well, again, I think... And then he's like, I, these are my real films. I, I think <laughs> part of it comes back to what motivated me to pursue it. Yeah. And as I have become more, you know, develop self-awareness and really ask myself, I wonder if a, a, a big motivator for me to do it was more ego driven. It was yeah. the status to be able to call myself a screenwriter, to see my name on the screen, yeah. to have the kind of directed money, by the money di- that you might have directed, if you're a yeah. successful screenwriter and what that would allow you to yeah. be able to do, what people would think of you. If you said, I mean, I'll be honest when I tell people, cause I went full time with YouTube last August. when I tell people that in their reaction, which I didn't expect initially, yeah. well, I'm, you know, I'm a YouTuber. You're almost apologetic about it yeah, because yeah, yeah, it's yeah. whatever. And then some people are like, really? Like yeah. they react in such a profound way and it sucks. But sometimes, and the next time somebody asks what you do, you're like, excited that well, they're going like, to react. You're positively. like an astronaut in an elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's ha- yeah. So that is possible. Right. So you can do that. Yeah. And that's not going to be the, the case in a few years, but just getting circling yeah. back, um, you, circling. I don't think we're going to get to the current of act. <laughs> yeah. Now we'll do that. <laughs> so we'll do that next. Yeah. Um, or we won't, <laughs> but whatever this, we're at doing this rate, episode will be pure and we'll tell the truth. <laughs> um, <laughs> we're lying. <laughs> I think the, you, you mentioned you were in Colorado yeah. and I want to, I want to see this camera. So, oh yes, yes. just it's okay. So go ahead and give the backstory so, to the mic. <laughs> and this, this will relate if you're someone that's going to listen to these episodes. I think the through line, uh, not necessarily the foundation of this being Rick Rubin's book, but, uh, this book helping me cement my understanding of the creative act, what it means to be creative, artistic pursuits, all yeah. that stuff. This, this book for me sort of put into words, a lot of the different philosophies I have, the points of view I have, et cetera. And, and, and especially it opened it up to include, uh, not just when I make a video or take a photo, but to include creativity when it comes to time with my family mm-hmm. or, uh, going out to dinner with my wife or these other things that you wouldn't think are creative, but they actually are. And that's a whole separate conversation that we'll put a pin in anyway. So my wife and two kids, we go to Colorado and we're in Estes Park and I can be a little bit, um, as as part of my creativity, I can create a vision for how I want the day to unfold or sort of how I want things to be. And I have to be very careful because there are other collaborators in that, my wife and my kids. I have to be careful that I am not ignoring the truth of how they feel or what they want and just going on rails with what, what I want to do and making them join me because I have this, again, this vision for how the day is going to go. So this happened to me in Rocky mountain national park. We are um, at the alluvial fan and the kids are climbing on the rocks and all that, but it starts raining, which is fine. Cause we were getting close to wrapping up our time there. Well, my grand vision of sort of saying goodbye to the park and having like a, a wonderful drive through it was to leave from the exit that, uh, was opposite of the one that we entered in the entrance that we came yeah. in. So a longer drive through the park to exit. Well, in me communicating that to my wife, she thought I was talking about exiting through the entrance that we came into. So this going out the same place we came in. And so as we're heading that way, and I, you know, I'm not the best inside Rocky mountain to kind of have my bearings as we're heading that way. I'm like, babe, is this the isn't this where we entered? And she's like, yeah, isn't that where you wanted to go out? I said, no, I wanted to go out the other exit because I wanted, I had this vision for this grand drive and seeing the mountains and stopping and taking a photo, whatever. 
So I was a little frustrated that um, I my what I thought I had effectively communicated was not effectively communicated. Uh, Your vision was not going to be correct. Yeah. My vision was not going to be realized. So I'm pretty good at going. Okay, that's not you know that's that's not going to happen anymore. So I'm just going to let go, and we're going to go this new route. So as we're driving out of the park, you know, there's different hotels and resorts and all this stuff, and I'm kind of taking it in, and we come across like a strip mall, and it has a, a donut place called Squatchy Donuts. Uh, the owners are. Uh, firm believers in the existence of Squatch, <laughs> Sasquatch. And so they made a donut stop that's uh, you know, reminiscent of that. And they have all these fun flavors. Did they have stuff. a giant donut on the... Their thing is mini donuts. Oh. They do like a like a plate... The most a tray overused... Of tiny donuts. Piece of advertising yeah. is the giant donut. <laughs> right, right. But it's all Sasquatch yeah. stuff. Bigfoot. So um, I'm like, okay, so I start casting a new vision, right? This is me being creative, the creative act. I start going, I, I get, an, I get a, a vision really quick. I'm like, well, let's stop for donuts. Us and the kids will have a fun snack. They're pretty regimented with their sugar. And so like, let's just go have some fun. And then there's a thrift store next door. And I go, aha, I can check the thrift store to see if they have yep. any cameras there. So all of a sudden, the frustration of the old vision not happening is replaced with the excitement of this new vision unfolding. Yeah. Okay. So we have our donuts and all that stuff. And I go into the thrift store and my wife likes to look through the kids clothing. Cause she sometimes finds some items that we can get at a low cost yeah. that the kids can wear. So she's doing that. The kids are kind of here and there. And I ask the, uh, the clerk or the owner, uh, do you have any, you know, cameras, old digital cameras or whatever? And he's like, well, we've got a drawer over here. He takes me over, looks in the drawer. It's all these accessories. There's no yep. cameras in there. He's like, but we did just get a Canon film camera in if you want to take a look at that. And I had seen what looked like a black camera case behind the front desk. And I was like, oh, I wonder what that is. Yeah. So as we go over, I'm thinking it's going to be like an AE1, an SLR, which is cool, but I'm not, I'm more interested in like range really finders and digicams yeah. and stuff. So, um, well, can you just, just to even go even further, like, yeah. we've talked about you getting a range finder, right. Has been like the ultimate mm -hmm. goal. Um, we've and I talked about it on several occasions for probably right. five months now. Yep. And I'm not ready to pull the trigger on a, on a right. Leica film camera, uh, quite yet. Cause I want to have that experience with maybe a more accessible one right. as far as price point goes and, and all that and get used to shooting on film without it being an automatic point and shoot film camera. Right. Uh, so, you know, I have a list of some cameras that I really want that are on my like digicam 35 millimeter film camera list that if I see them at a thrift store, I'm going to be like really excited to see it. Right. Um, so he brings the camera case over and I open it up and I gasped. I'm like, oh, like this is one of the film cameras that's on my list. And I had, you know, never seen it in person before. Yeah. Um, only on YouTube videos uh, or photographs. And this thing looked, other than being dusty and a little, you know, kind of grimy, it looked pristine. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the camera is a, a range finder that Canon made through the 60s and 70s. Yes. Called um, the Canon QL17 G3. Oh my gosh, that one is I, I added this on shape. there. Uh, and it's cleaned up. I did a full detailing of it. Okay, um, so this is only for the people that are watching. You can screw it off if you want to. The the ex, is it extruding? Yeah. The extruding or lens protruding. Protruding. Thank yeah. you. Yep. The uh, protruding lens cap, absolutely essential because yes. then you can do this. Yep. So to anybody out there who's not in on this, <laughs> this is the best way. Best way to stow a camera. Your lens is protected. Mm -hmm. Nothing can hit it. Yep. This is actually amazing, though. I mean, <laughs> this is like a hundred and thirty dollar camera. I, I've you know, and I've seen some of them. Well, you know, it's not the black one. The black one goes for quite you know quite high. But you don't um, film in here. No, I, I I took out the light seals. Uh, I scraped them all out, which was a pain in the butt. And um, I'm getting a kit, a pr like a kit that's they're all pre cut and they're coming. Um. So I haven't been able to test it to make sure that, you know, film goes through it, that, you know, the, the, uh, everything works. The, the, the shutter this, opens. This is that you were telling me on the phone. So this is the first time I've seen this camera. Yeah. 
um, and I'm, this apologize for no, anybody that's watching yeah. or that's listening because there's some camera ASMR for you. Beautiful. Um, cause yeah, we're just playing with the camera. It's probably not very entertaining audio, but this is, um, he was telling me on the phone that the viewfinder is a little foggy. Yeah. Simply, it seems like it might be a little it's, hazy. This, this is like perfect condition. It is correct. It's, yeah. Okay. It's, they just, I'm not sure if it's, they use plastic or, but they, well, they're the, just kind of blue. Yeah. That's just okay. kind of how, at That's least in my experience, what I've, what I've played with. So, you know, I've gone to numerous thrift stores throughout the Omaha area and have been for the most part disappointed that there really aren't a lot of cameras. Goodwill, first of all, it doesn't matter what Goodwill yeah. you go to anymore. They send it off to shopgoodwill.com mm-hmm. and, uh, and it gets auctioned off. Uh, and that makes sense because they're going to get more profit from that mm-hmm. than if somebody buys it at the actual store. Uh, and then, you know, different antique stores here. I, I mean, the, it has been slim pickings. There may be other photographers that are out really scouring the different antique shops and thrift stores and whatever uh, here in the Omaha area. But I'm I'm telling you, this this was the last thing I expected to find at that thrift store. This is this is sweet. I think yeah. it's what a good metaphor for just letting things unfold. Exactly. And something's not necessarily going as expected. Sometimes that, or I feel like usually Mm -hmm. that's the best case scenario. And I think that's where agenda comes in, you know, like you can, you can build a vision or a vision comes to you for what you want to do. And sometimes the source, the universe, the whatever you want to call it takes you in a different direction. And I think if you live in your frustration or something negative because what you originally thought was going to happen didn't happen uh, and don't keep yourself open to creating something new. And this all sounds very corny, but that's just sort of like if I had a system of faith or spirituality or whatever, it is that it is. If you're going to be frustrated that what you thought was going to happen didn't happen, the creative act that you set out to, 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 to have or to make uh, just let go of it. You know, you don't know what, what it means or yeah. what's going to come of it. It looks yeah. brand new. I it mean, does. I mean, it is, it is in next to flawless condition. Yeah. So I'm really excited if, to share uh, with this. If that was a Japanese camera, it'd be the mint, mint, yeah. plus, 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 yeah, plus, yeah, yeah, plus, yeah, yeah. mint. Yeah. Mint plus, 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 plus. Well, cool. <laughs> I think that's a good, uh, a good note to end it on. It had been a golden afternoon. And I remember having the familiar conviction that life was beginning over again with the summers. Thank you.